Mothers are known to give life through their abilities to birth and nurture. But with Amelia Carr, a mother of four, love was too big a deal for her. She only wanted one thing, to have her already married lover, Joshua Fulgham, all to herself. This pushed her to commit the ultimate crime, murder. So is all really fair in love and war? This and much more will be covered as we meet the youngest US woman on death row. Meet Amelia Carr. How does someone with an IQ of 125 wind up becoming a cold-blooded killer at the age of 24? That is the question that first comes to mind when you come across Amelia Carr's unfortunate story. However, as we begin to sift through the layers of Carr's traumatic early years, one thing that becomes clear is that despite her young age, trouble seemed to find her wherever she went. And so, it isn't far-fetched to say that perhaps her fate had already been sealed before she had even been born. Amelia Carr was born on August 4, 1984, Amelia Yera. She was the second of three sisters and showed a bright spark right from her childhood. Despite having a humble upbringing, Carr excelled at school and received A's and B's in most of her courses. She later enrolled in Army ROTC and seemed to have the world at her feet until a series of unfortunate events led to her having to drop out of high school. Still, Carr was able to earn her GED before going on to take a course at the Barbizon School of Modeling. Additionally, she attended a massage therapy school and was an aspiring photographer. Everything from Amelia Carr's early years pointed to the fact that she was a girl of many dreams. Maria Zayas, Amelia Carr's mother, emphasized this fact while testifying during the penalty phase of her daughter's murder trial, you could hear the pain in her voice as she spoke about Carr's early accomplishments, which Zaya summed up by saying she had everything. So how then does someone with above-average intelligence, who seemingly had everything, become the youngest US woman on death row? For Amelia Carr's family, the answer is quite simple. Their dear Lily, as she is fondly called by her family, made a string of wrong choices, which were triggered by the trauma she felt from having a dysfunctional childhood. Amelia Carr's mother, Maria, faced many hardships, which is a common theme for most migrants in search of a better life. In a bid to find work, the former migrant worker frequently moved from state to state and already had her first daughter when she was only 14. Things were certainly not rosy for Maria and her daughters growing up, as the family had to deal with crippling poverty in between frequent visits to the hospital due to the frail health of Amelia Carr's sisters. Although Carr didn't require quite as much medical attention as her sisters, she was fighting a different kind of battle throughout her childhood. Carr was sexually abused by her father and grandfather from the age of five until she was 15, when she eventually reported the abuse to her school. She later retracted the statement when she was interrogated by law enforcement officers. Emilia Carr's family drama didn't stop there, as her father was later convicted in 2004 of attempting to solicit the murder of several family members, including Carr and her mother. He was sentenced to four years in prison. Despite recanting her sexual abuse claims against her father as a teenager, Carr would later open up about her sordid childhood during an emotional jailhouse interview. In her words, my childhood consisted of responsibility, secrets, and sexual perversion. I remember at night, there's this board that creaks right before you get to the door, and I could be in a dead sleep, and you'd hear that board creak, and you'd think, is it going to be tonight? Just like her mum, Amelia Carr gave birth to her first child when she was just 14. She later dropped out of high school, despite being one of the better students, and thus began her descent. Carr seemed determined to repeat her mother's mistakes by getting herself involved with men of questionable characters. Before Amelia Carr met Joshua Fulgham, she had already been married twice, and even filed a restraining order against one of her ex-husbands citing domestic violence. Carr was also sentenced to two years probation for her role in her ex-husband's grand theft of exotic birds. Amidst all the drama in her personal life, Carr had already welcomed three children, including one with ex-boyfriend Jamie Acomb. By the time Carr was 22, she was already a far cry from the bright young girl who had the world as her oyster. She was now boxed in a corner with three children, two failed marriages, and in desperate need of a lifeline. What Carr needed to do at this point was to clean up her act and get her life back on track. Unfortunately, she couldn't help but make the wrong choice again. She went and found herself a new man, Joshua Fulgham, and Heather Strong moved to Florida from Mississippi to try and create a new spark in their problematic relationship. The two began dating when Strong was in her teens and already had two children when they moved to Florida in 2003. However, their relationship was plagued by several instances of domestic violence. In fact, Strong instituted at least two domestic violence injunctions against Fulgham, one in September 2008 and another in January 2009. Fulgham would later be arrested in January 2009 for aggravated assault with a firearm after threatening Strong with a shotgun. He did some jail time, but was later released after the charge was dropped at Strong's request. Strong and Fulgham's relationship was a big worry for the latter's family, who were well aware of Fulgham's history of violence. Heather Strong's mother, Carolyn Spence, made several attempts to get her daughter to leave Fulgham, but all her pleas fell on deaf ears. 
Despite all their troubles, the couple moved to Florida with their children in the hopes of a new beginning. Unsurprisingly, things stayed the same, and Strong eventually decided to quit the relationship sometime in 2008. She soon moved in with a co-worker, Benjamin McCollum, but the two became intimate shortly after the move-in. Meanwhile, Fulgham also seemed to have moved on from the relationship, as he had already begun seeing Amelia Carr around August 2007. But once Fulgham learned of Strong's new relationship, he was overcome with jealousy and began stalking the duo. Over the next six months, Fulgham made life unbearable for Strong and McCollum, threatening them with a weapon on two separate occasions. In November 2008, Fulgham asked Carr, who was already pregnant for him at the time, to marry him. Bizarrely, barely a month later, Fulgham and Strong left everyone stunned when they walked down the aisle in a low-key ceremony. Despite the marriage, Carr remained in the picture and even babysat Strong and Fulgham's children on several occasions. However, the stage was already set, and what ensued was a messy love triangle that eventually led to the gruesome murder of Strong at the young age of 26. First interrogation. Heather Strong should have never gotten married to Joshua Fulgham. However, it seemed he had some kind of hold on her that always made her stick around, despite all the red flags. Even though she had found some peace in her relationship with Benjamin McCollum, Strong decided to walk away from it and then proceeded to walk down the aisle with Fulgham. Although she reportedly did it for her kids, it proved to be a fatal mistake. Barely a week after they got married, Strong and Fulgham's marriage was on the brink following a domestic violence incident between the two in which Fulgham threatened Strong with a shotgun. He was subsequently arrested and spent several weeks in jail. During that time, Strong sought succor in the arms of her former lover, McCollum. Meanwhile, Carr visited Fulgham several times in jail, which eventually led to them rekindling their romance. Once the two were back together, Carr began working with Joshua Fulgham's mother to get him out of jail. They approached Strong to write a letter requesting for Fulgham's release, but she consistently refused their entreaties. At some point, Carr became angered by Strong's refusal to write the letter and decided to take matters into her own hands. On a fateful day, following a heated argument, Carr put a knife to Strong's neck and threatened to kill her if she didn't write the letter. Luckily for Strong, Jamie Ocom, a mutual friend and father to one of Carr's children, was there to douse the tension before things turned awry. After this incident, Strong succumbed to Carr's demand and wrote the letter, which affected Fulgham's release. Nevertheless, there was no going back for Strong, as she had already decided to end her marriage barely two months into it. She planned to leave Boardman, Florida, and return to her family in Mississippi with her kids. This led to a bitter custody battle between Strong and Fulgham, who desperately tried to block her from leaving with their kids. Amidst the custody battle for their two children, Strong mysteriously disappeared and was reported missing by her cousin on February 15, 2009. When a person goes missing, it is standard practice for investigators to first look at the closest people to the victim, especially their spouses or lovers. This was the case here, but since there wasn't anything substantive to hold Fulgham, investigators couldn't hold him as a suspect after initial questioning. The police authorities were still in the dark regarding why or what may have caused her disappearance when Fulgham was arrested on suspicion of fraud for using Strong's credit cards while she was still missing. This understandably sent the wrong signals, and the police brought him in for further questioning regarding the disappearance of his wife. During his interrogation, Fulgham maintained that he knew nothing about the disappearance of his wife and claimed that the last time that he saw her was some days earlier when he dropped her off at a local Petro. However, when the police checked through the cameras at the Petro, there was no footage of Strong at the Petro on that particular date that Fulgham claimed he had dropped her off. The police also discovered that Fulgham was in a relationship with a woman named Emilia Carr, who had threatened his wife with a knife shortly before she went missing. With investigators convinced that Fulgham knew more than he was telling, they decided to bring Carr in for questioning too. Once Carr gets to the station, things start to get interesting in the investigation. The investigator who led Emilia Carr's interrogation started with a friendly tone, which she reciprocated by calmly opening up about her relationship with Fulgham and Strong. At the beginning of the interrogation, Carr's body language and hand gestures gave the impression that she was eager to help the police with the investigation and willingly admitted that some animal existed between herself and Strong. However, Carr tried to be clever by making it seem as if Strong was the one antagonizing her because she felt insecure about the on-and-off relationship Carr had with her husband. The interrogation takes a new turn when the investigator asks her when was the last time she saw Strong. Carr claimed she last saw Strong a few days after Fulgham went to prison while she was babysitting Strong and Fulgham's children. At this point, the detective decides to switch things up and confronts her about a fight that happened between the two women on that fateful night. The detective asked her about threatening
threatening Strong with a knife, and Carr completely denied it ever happened. When Carr is told that Jamie, the father of her first child, who was there during that night, had spoken to the police about the altercation, she immediately became evasive and tried to discredit his testimony by claiming they had a bad history. The detective, knowing he had Carr just where he wanted her, pressed on and gave her enough opportunities to come clean. However, Carr stubbornly maintained that she had not pulled a knife on Strong and continuously attempted to deflect from the question by bringing up other unrelated situations. The detective then brings up another instance where several witnesses claimed to be present, when Carr had offered someone $500 to get rid of Strong. Interestingly, before the detective could finish off his sentence, Carr scoffs in amusement, showing that she knew exactly what he was talking about. This forces the detective to adopt a more aggressive approach, and he wastes no time in accusing Carr of deliberately stonewalling the interrogation. The detective further accuses her of telling lies and gives her one more chance to come clean. For the second time, Carr denies the allegation and goes on to label it a rumor. She explained, okay, well, what I'm telling you is, me and her got into it and I asked to leave. Well, after that, there were rumors from Jamie, Jason, that I was supposedly trying to pay someone to get rid of her this and that. I'm not going to stoop to that kind of a level over a man. I'm sorry it's not worth it. Carr again tries to go after the credibility of both witnesses in this instance, Jamie Acomb and Joseph Marshall. She claimed both men have some sort of vendetta against her and they have made her life hell for as long as she can remember. Carr states that Jamie's grouse with her is presumably over child support and then mentions several names associated with Jamie, whom she believes may also be trying to bring her down. Despite Carr's continuous denial of everything thrown at her, the detective is clearly not buying it, and in a last-ditch effort to get the truth from her, he tries to pit her against Fulgham. He warns her she needs to think of herself first, before telling her Fulgham is in another room. He then leaves her with her thoughts and heads over to Fulgham's interrogation room. The police believed Carr had a motive for wanting to have Strong out of the way. However, they didn't have much on Fulgham except a recorded phone call he made to Strong while he was in prison that clearly showed she feared he was going to kill her. Running out of ideas, investigators decided to play a fast one on Fulgham when an opportunity fortuitously opened up. They made him believe Carr had cooperated with investigators and had been sent home as a result. Fearing that Carr must have turned on him, Fulgham finally cracked. He confessed that Carr told him she, Strong, was gone and to leave it alone. The police had finally caught a break and they moved to close the case while questioning Amelia Carr the second time. Second interrogation. Following the breakthrough in the investigation, the police invited Amelia for another round of questioning. This time around, the air in the room was more tense, and the detective skipped all the pleasantries and went straight into the business of the day. Going by Joshua Fulgham's confession, Carr was the mastermind behind Heather Strong's disappearance, and the detective wasted no time in laying out the facts in front of her. Picking up from where he stopped during the first interrogation, he reminded her of the need to look out for herself, and also chipped in on how her boyfriend, Fulgham, had thrown her under the bus. He said, I'm telling you right now, your boyfriend has thrown you under the bus. He's admitted to lying. He's admitted okay that he's involved in this and knows about it and that you know about it. Although the detectives had been able to break Fulgham quite easily, they weren't going to enjoy the same luck with Carr. She displayed a high level of intelligence as she probably saw through the game the detective was playing in trying to set the two lovers against each other. Carr maintained her innocence and continued to deflect by bringing up scenarios that were completely different from the questions that were asked by the detective at different points in time. Despite putting on a brave show, it was clear to see that she wasn't as confident here as she was in her first interview. Fulgham's betrayal somewhat left her unsettled as she tried to explain to the detective that she had an alibi for her whereabouts on the day Strong went missing. As the interrogation progressed, it became clear to the detective that he wouldn't be able to get anything out of Carr. So, he again switched his focus to Fulgham, who was still in police custody. Initially, he claimed he didn't have any more information and emphatically stated that Carr had all the answers to the questions being asked about Strong's whereabouts. Finally, with the prospect of jail hanging over him and possibly not wanting to go down alone, Fulgham signaled to the detective that he had something else to say. Fulgham agreed to take the detective to Strong. However, he had a strange request. He asked that his wallet be taken to his mum, and the detective, without a thought, agreed to his request. On March 19, 2009, Fulgham led police detectives to the back of Amelia Carr's house, where Heather Strong's remains were found inside a shallow grave. The case officially became a homicide, and Fulgham was generous enough to provide detectives with their first lead by pointing them straight to Carr. Armed with the discovery of Strong's body and Carr's property, two new detectives take up Carr's interrogation and explain how dire the situation is for her. One of the detectives tells her that all of the proof gathered up until that moment points to her as the 
prime suspect and hammers on how her dishonesty from the start of the process has put her in such an untenable position. He goes on to promise her that they will do everything to help her, but she needs to start being completely honest with them. After dribbling around with her words for some time, Carr finally begins to give her account of Heather Strong's last moments. Carr completely exonerates herself from the murder, stating that she had only come across Heather Strong's lifeless body in her trailer after she had supposedly been whacked in the head by Fulgham. She emphasized how she told him severally that she wanted nothing to do with the situation and warned him if he didn't do something about the body, she would call the cops. Carr claimed she had no idea he had buried the body on her mom's property and concluded by saying that Fulgham had warned her not to mention what happened to anybody or else he would make sure that she went down with him. She later took the detectives back to the trailer and gave them a bit-by-bit -bit account of what she felt happened to Strong on the day she went missing. Despite Carr's explanations, the investigators still felt there were so many loopholes in her story and they once again turned to Fulgham to help plug in those holes. Seeing as they were already at the end of the road, Fulgham furnished detectives with details of what exactly happened. He explained that Carr had lured Strong to the trailer behind her mother's home where he overpowered her, allowing Carr to suffocate her with a plastic bag over her head following unsuccessful attempts to break her neck. Still looking to get an actual confession from Carr, the police decide to employ some trickery, which involves Joshua Fulgham's sister wearing a wire in a bid to get the truth out of Carr. With everyone seemingly against her, Carr opened up to the one person she still saw as a friend, and the police got everything on tape. In the audio recording, Carr can be heard telling Fulgham's sister, we tried to snap her neck but that didn't work. When the sister asked why Carr would try to break Strong's neck, she replied, I thought it would be quick and painless. With Carr finally admitting her involvement in Strong's death, the police bring her in for more questioning, where they confront her with the audio recording. Surprisingly, Carr remains emotionless as the detectives reveal how they went about staging her conversation with Fulgham's sister. This leads one of the detectives to accuse her of being unremorseful and also acting like a cold-hearted, hateful person who killed the mother of two children. Despite all the evidence facing her, Carr still finds a way to try and save herself. She claimed that she only attempted to break Strong's neck and since that didn't work, she can't be at fault for her murder. Carr then continuously states that she only did what Fulgham had asked her to do, once again trying to exonerate herself from any blame. However, her weak attempt to escape any sort of accountability for her part in the mindless killing of Heather Strong was quickly knocked back by the detectives, who continued to press her with more facts. After some more back and forth, Carr finally admitted to playing a part in the murder. However, she argued that she only did it out of fear of what Fulgham might do to her if she didn't play along. The detectives are again quick to make light work of her claims of fear, and further highlight how she had several opportunities to pull out of the whole thing from the moment the plan to kill Strong was hatched. Carr later apologized for her role in the murder, saying she was sorry for being a monster and helping a monster. This brought an end to the interrogation process, which lasted several weeks, and both Amelia Carr and Joshua Fulgham were charged with murder. Amelia Carr later gave birth to her fourth child, a daughter, while in custody at the Marion County Jail. Her daughter, with Fulgham, was later adopted, while her family took custody of her three older children. After spending three months at the Marion County Jail, Amelia Carr did a complete U-turn, completely recanting her confession during her interrogation. Carr claimed she was not involved in Strong's murder and argued that her earlier confession was coerced out of her due to her fear of going to jail. Epilogue Following the stacked-up evidence from the police, including confessions from Amelia Carr and Joshua Fulgham, the killer couple were charged with kidnapping and first-degree murder. Initially, the pair pleaded not guilty, but the state sought more than the guilty. Verdict. They were gunning for the death penalty. Still, the court is always mandated to follow due process by allowing all sides the opportunity to argue their cases and, for some, the chance to prove their innocence. With Heather Strong's family, led by her mother, Carolyn Spence, desperately calling for blood, it wasn't too much of a surprise to see the family members of the accused show unwavering support for their own. For Amelia Carr's family, the evidence was overwhelmingly against their Lily, that the only way they saw out of the tight spot was to turn their anger on the man at the center of the love triangle. Carr's mother heaped the blame on Fulgham, claiming that his decision to turn around and get married to Strong despite proposing to Carr was the genesis of all the confusion. Maria Zayas claimed Fulgham's betrayal was an overwhelming pain for the single mum. In her words, she just couldn't believe it. She was hurt. Here, he proposed to her 
her, bought the ring for her, and in December, he came and took it and married Heather. On the other side of the divide, this argument did not make any sense to Strong's family, as her cousin, Misty Strong, believed that the marriage was all a facade that played well into Amelia and Fulgham's plan to get rid of Strong. Why else would Amelia let him marry her? Quizzed the rather disgusted Misty Strong. Strong's mother-in-law, Spence, also mentioned how toxic her daughter's romance with Fulgham had been through the years, specifically referring to one particular instance where Fulgham had threatened to feed her daughter to the alligators. Spence explained that she was completely freaked out after receiving a threatening phone call from Fulgham in which he claimed he had tied up her daughter, taped her mouth, and put her in the trunk of his car. In his words, alligators would eat her alive. Despite Fulgham's history of violence with the mother of his two kids, the prosecutor still felt there was sufficient evidence proving that Carr was the mastermind behind Strong's untimely death. As the trial progressed, the state prosecutors took advantage of a psychological evaluation that deemed Amelia Carr as having an above-average IQ to score a somewhat massive victory against her. Citing the gulf in intelligence between Carr and Fulgham, the prosecutor argued that she very well masterminded the entire thing, or at least was more guilty than her lover. Furthermore, State Attorney Brad sent the court into a moment of deep reflection and dismissed any notion that Carr was manipulated by Fulgham when he said to the jury, she knows right from bad and she's smarter than most of us. Amid Carr's effort to absolve herself of any guilt in Strong's murder, her arguments weren't strong enough to convince the 12-man jury of her innocence. On February 21, 2011, a few days after the anniversary of Strong's death, the penalty for her crime was announced. Seven out of the 12 jurors voted in favor of the death penalty, making Emily Carr the youngest woman in the U.S. on death row. While delivering the final judgment, the judge described the then 24-year-old as a cold-hearted person and sent her off with the words, May God have mercy on your soul. Interestingly, Joshua Fulgham received a lighter sentence than Amelia Carr, with the majority of the jurors voting for life imprisonment for him in 2012. The judge concluded the case by ruling a two-term life sentence for Fulgham without the possibility of parole. However, this wasn't to be Fulgham's last run-in with the law. After being convicted for his role in the kidnapping and first-degree murder case of his wife, Heather Strong, another charge was slapped against him a few years later. In May 2015, he was charged with aggravated battery, using a deadly weapon. The following year, he received an extra 15-year sentence. During this time, Amelia Carr had managed to gain some support for herself within the mainstream media and was actively pushing for a review of her sentencing. She began to familiarize herself with the laws and asked questions about what she perceived as an injustice against women. In recognition of her activism, a handful of noteworthy journalists have had a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with the convict in a bid to understand her pain and also create a level playing ground for women at all levels. At age 30, the youngest woman on death row in the US told Vogue Williams, an Irish model and TV personality at the Female Correctional Institute in Ocala, Central Florida, that all she could do following the judgment was to put up a brave face for her mother, who had taken the pronouncement pretty badly. The woman who was once accused of being cold-hearted couldn't hold back the tears as she opened up about life on death row and her aspirations for the future. After losing her way for many years, Carr was finally dreaming again, but a lot had happened since she was that little girl holding a lot of promise. After the interview, Williams revealed she felt pity for Carr because she was still so young. During the interview, Carr also displayed some maturity when Williams hinted that Strong's family may feel convinced that she deserved the judgment. The young argued that even though she understood that a lot of emotions were involved, she still felt that there was some disparity in how she was treated by the family when compared to their reaction to Fulgham's sentencing. For her, it was quite shocking that the family wanted her on death row but didn't extend the same energy towards Fulgham. She concluded by saying, I believe that in this country, women are still fighting for equal standing with men. Men can commit crimes and it will be in the media and it will die down so quick, but let a woman do it, and it carries on, and it carries on. When TV reporter Diane Sawyer had her turn with Carr and her fellow death row inmate Tiffany, she was shocked by the women's optimism. Both women were convicted of taking life alongside their boyfriends, but they shared the same idea about fighting to overturn their sentencing until the very end. They coined the word life row as a more optimistic way of looking at their sentencing and enlightened Sawyer about their determination to never entertain a defeated mentality. However, the duo refused to discuss their case, but instead wanted the world to know that if given the chance, they would certainly do things differently. Carr also took the opportunity to express her deepest condolences towards Strong's family. Although she still maintained her innocence, she felt sorry the mother of two died a gruesome death. Before returning to her cell, Carr made sure she took a jibe at the justice system, citing how women, the minority race, and those with no social status never get to have a fair trial. She finally blamed the media for feeding off women's crimes and the negativity it breeds. In 2015, after going on trial, in the Supreme Court, the judge upheld Amelia Carr's previous sentencing. The judgment was a heavy blow to Amelia Carr, but victory soon came in another form for the convicted killer. 
Five years into serving her death row sentence, Florida Governor Rick Scott reviewed the state's death penalty laws, stating that there must be a unanimous jury decision before the death penalty can stand in a trial. This meant that a 7, 5, or 8, 4 vote was not enough to put a prisoner up for death. This new law took effect in 2017, leading to numerous death row prisoners, including Emilia Carr, getting downgraded to a life sentence. For more content like this, click on the videos showing on your screen now.